Welcome everybody. I'm so glad to be here today to share with you. I'm trusting God to move in your lives. I'm trusting God for apostolic grace to be released. I'm trusting God for the gift of miracles to be released in your lives and to move you into the next levels that you ought to be. Praise God. Thank you very much. Um, also joining us is our Making Your Life Count um, group. And so those of you who are watching online, Making Your Life Count, I want to welcome you to this broadcast again. And I do believe that God, who has begun a good work in your life, will bring it to pass and he will complete it. And over the next couple of weeks, I, I, I want you to stay tuned because I really know that there's going to be a shift as it were, there's going to be a reconfiguration in your spirit, man, that will change things around you in the name of Jesus Christ. I, I, I strongly believe that somebody is about to enter into a certain dimension of destiny that has been eluding you before in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice, everyone under the sound of my voice is going to make contact with that which has already been designed for them before the foundations of the earth in the name of Jesus. God said to um, Jeremiah, he says, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Again, I always say this is one of the reasons why we must always treasure that baby that is still in the womb. Those who say we have to kill children and do abortions and stuff and stuff, you know, they, they, they are saying it because they don't know God. If you know God, before you were in the womb, I knew you. When you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I made you a prophet. Each and every one of us have a purpose in God. I want you to listen to me very carefully. Each and every one of us have a purpose in God. I don't care who you are. If you are sitting down right now on a chair, you are crippled, you are lame, you are maim. Mephibosheth even had a purpose. Everyone has a purpose in God. Your purpose may not be to become the biggest, uh, uh, most popular uh, pastor or bishop in the world. It could be something as small as just raising children for the glory of God. Your purpose might just be to edify, to encourage, but, but, but each of us have something in God for which we are going to give account for when we leave. In fact, one of the very exciting scriptures I have been contemplating lately, you can find it in Acts and chapter uh, 13 and verse 26. And there it says, for David... After he had served the, his own generation by the will of God. After he had served his generation by the will of God, fell asleep. He died and he was laid with his fathers. David, after he had served his generation. Listen, none of us are going to be here forever. I, 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 I can see, and I, and I like the way, um, you know, somebody introduced all of us. I think when, was it Pastor Webmimo when he came? We have done our own path to an extent, not, but we've played a certain role to be able to pioneer this ministry and, and, and set up this church. And you can see a lot of us who are here joining you today in TBR. We were there with, in TBR just two years ago, three years ago, we were there. I was actively pastoring the, the church. Uh, Pastor Wemimo was there. Iyere Bruno was there. All, all of them. George, Greg was there. And many of the people who are now moving to other stations and to do other things in life, which God has prepared us for, without losing the connection and the umbilical cord we still have. Because community ought to last our lifetime and into eternity. That's why God sets up community. So David did his own. But in this case, he served his generation by the will of God. I want to read another interesting translation. That I, One of the things, when you read the Bible a lot, 
you start using different translations. You see the pros and the cons of all translations. So I'm reading a new translation Bible, a Bible, a, a translation I have never used before. So I can see certain things I can get out of there. And I, I'm, I'm excited about certain things I'm seeing. I don't agree with everything, but there are some things that I'm, I'm really being blessed by. And it's called the Good News Bible, the UK version. So it's Good News Bible, the UK version. And, and it says, for David served the purposes, God's purposes in his own time. And then he died. And then he was buried with his ancestors and his body rotted in the grave. What an interesting way to put it. David served God's purposes in his own time. David served God's purposes in his own time. And, and I want you to know that, again, each and every one of us are born, are called, are brought to this earth to serve God's purposes in our own time. And the interesting thing about time is that time is not going to last forever on this side of eternity. You are a once in a lifetime, never to be repeated creation of God. Somebody says, which Bible verse? Acts and chapter 13, verse 26. Acts and chapter 13, verse 26. And like I was saying, you are a once in a lifetime, never to be repeated creation of God. You're not, you're not, you're not going to be repeated. There's not going to be reincarnation. And too many of us are exchanging our whole once in a lifetime life for much to live little. When we hear David served his, the will of God, the purposes of God, in other words, he was able to fulfill the purposes, Acts and chapter 13, verse 36. That's correct. David was able to fulfill the will of God. David was able to fulfill the will of God. Listen, at the end of the day, when you sit down and analyze your life, it will boil down to this. If you are already living on this earth and you are growing in the knowledge of God and the things of God, it will boil down to this. Am I serving God's purpose in my time, in my generation? Because that's what you're going to be judged with for all eternity. That's what is going to matter most, that I be in the perfect will of God. You see, Elijah, he was such a big prophet doing all sorts of things. But there was a period of time God just put him, go and attend to a, one woman, a widow at Zarephath for three and a half years. Now, imagine if he says, no, I'm, I'm too big. I'm going to do this. See, God understands what he wants you to do. And he knows what he wants you to do. However, there are certain things that we ourselves must cooperate with God so with so that we can fulfill his purposes and his will. Again, I want to ask you, are you serving God's purposes? It doesn't matter who is doing what they're doing. You can be related, the brother or sister, to somebody who is the, the big pastor and filling stadiums of millions of people and, and and God is just giving you a small thing in a small corner and not just that, he's using you in his own way. The point is, are you serving God's purposes in your generation? Are you living for yourself? Are you living just to do what you want to do? And like the average person in the world who's here to make money, to be rich and to be comfortable, Oh, God is going to do all that and more to us if that is in line with his purpose. But you have to be hungry like David was. Listen, David was hungry to do the purpose of God. And today I'm going to start a series with you. I call Lessons from Ziklag. Lessons from Ziklag. And of course, we know that the story of David, I'm going to try and capture David's life using some lessons from Ziklag. I want to show you how that when we hear David served the will of God and he fulfilled the purposes of God according to the will of God. He fulfilled the purpose of God in his generation. Sometimes we think, wow, David was so favored. David was so favored. No, he was favored. But David was a great fighter. Listen, if you are going to be a great winner in this life, you must be a great fighter. 
I'm going to show you today, part one of this series, that great winners are great fighters. In fact, in Exodus and chapter 13, verse 17, the Bible says that God has just led the children of Israel out of Egypt with his mighty hand, more than 10 plagues, bombasted Pharaoh, who was so wicked and so hardened, but it broke him down, hallelujah, with a mighty hand. And then he was expecting his people to go into destiny, fulfill purpose. But you know what hindered, hindered them? In Acts and chapter 13, verse 17, oh, sorry, in um, uh, Exodus and chapter 13, verse 17, the Bible tells us that the children of God, that God knew that if they saw war, they will run away. Let me just quickly read this verse. It says, and it came to pass that when Pharaoh let the people go, that God did not lead them through the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was nearer. For God said, if these people see war, they will despair and return back to Egypt. Are you looking at this? So destiny is before them. A great destiny. They had just experienced something amazing of God. The parting of Red Seas. You know, dismantling of a whole empire. A whole kingdom. Worse than those who are trying to destroy, you know, the, 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 the soul of, of, you know, many nations you look around today, you hear war in Russia, war in, picture some of these people over these nations today. And then imagine Pharaoh. Pharaoh is worse than all of these wicked people put together. Some of these people destroying, they are so powerful and you can't do anything about it unless God helps you. They had seen it supernaturally. Yet when they got before, you know, the, to, the, to, to, to the desert, and it was time to go and take over the Philistine land, which was the land that God wanted to give to them. They were afraid. They couldn't fight. You're going to discover that it's a similar thing with David. Anybody who's going to fulfill destiny must be a fighter. I want to tell you. Anybody, if you're going to fulfill the will of God in your generation, you have to fight. If you are not going to fight, you are not going to win. You're not going to win anything for God. You're not going to win anything for yourself. You're not going to win anything for your community. You're not going to win anything at all. David was a great fighter. Let me read um, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. That's going to be our main text throughout the series. But from here, I'm going to take lessons from Ziglag, and I'm going to use them to show you how David fulfilled the will of God and how you can fulfill the will of God and how you must fulfill the will of God. And like I said, I trust God for impartation and reconfiguration of your inner man. He says that we'll be strengthened with might in our inner man so that we will know what is the will of God and we will fulfill it. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name. Because it wouldn't matter for me, it, it wouldn't matter that, you know, whether somebody is big or small or I'm not in a competition with anybody. I'm in a competition with myself, with working with the Holy Ghost to fulfill the will of God in my generation and then go back and then I'll get rotten in the grave when my time has come. You and I, that has to be our life's passion. That has to be our life's this, this, this desire and pursuit. So the Bible says in 1 Samuel 30, you get a lot of solid lessons and principles. And the first today, I'm saying great winners are great fighters. If you want to be a winner in destiny, you want to attain divine destiny, it's not going to be served to you on a platter of gold. So even though we read in Acts 13 and 36, David fulfilled the will of God, we read all of that in Acts 13, it doesn't mean that it was served to David on a platter of gold, as we're going to see. Anyways, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, we see the scriptures. It says, two days later, I'm reading from the Good News version. David and his men arrived back at Ziklag. The Amalekites had raided southern Judah and attacked Ziklag. They had burnt down the town and captured all the women. 
they did not kill anyone, but they took every one of them and left with them. When David and his men arrived, they found that the town had been burnt down and that their wives and their sons and their daughters had been carried away. David and his men started crying and did not stop until they were completely exhausted. Even David's two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, had been taken away. Wow. David was now in great trouble because his men were all very bitter about losing their children and they were threatening to stone him. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. I'm going to stop in verse 6 today. I'll continue next week. But here, I want to begin to form a story for you. I want to show you how that David, you just read, he, he was in Ziklag. What is Ziklag? You have to understand what Ziklag is to understand before we can even proceed to, 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 to begin to understand how David was able to fight, fight and uh, how he was able to um, uh, fulfill this destiny that, 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 that was ahead of him. Now, Ziklag was the place that, first of all, David escaped to, and then it was given to him as a land while he was in exile. Because what had happened was that we know the story of how David had killed Goliath, how David had um, killed a bear and all of that, and we're going to get to all that, but you, we know all of that. But we also know the story that when David killed Goliath, he was now made the captain of Saul's armies. And as he became the captain, people began to see David has killed in his 10,000. Saul killed 1,000. And so Saul became jealous. And so Saul said, I'm going to slay this man. I'm going to kill. And so Saul began to pursue him everywhere, all over the whole place. David ran helter skelter. The, you, you know, somebody said something. I was reading the other day. It's political stuff, though. He said, there are three things you should fear. One is God, uh, God, two is government, and three is guns. These three things, if you put your head against them, anyhow, you might run yourself into trouble. And I guess that's one of the reasons why Jesus said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar, and give to God what is God's. So, understand this. When the whole government of Israel came against one man, he has no army, he has nothing. Every nook and cranny, they are looking for to the point that anyone that gave him shelter, including priests, were all slaughtered. <laughs> we will get to that. But in any case, David escapes. He, he did something that was out of the ordinary, as you're going to see. Because, because winners, they do extraordinary things in the fight for destiny. They have extraordinary faith and they do extraordinary things. He did something that was out of, 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 of sync with, with, the, with the normal and the traditional. He ran to Gath. Gath is outside Israel. It's, it's, it's the hometown of, of, what's his name? Of Goliath, whom David had killed. For some reason, when he got there, he, he got to a particular king of Gath. For some reason, this is how, when we walk by faith, God also walks with us. David became, he had to, started acting like a madman. He, the Bible says he feigned madness. He began to pretend like he was a crazy person. And I, I will talk about that. But I'm giving you the background of Ziklag. And so when he began to act like that, the king called Ashish said, look, is this not David? This the superstar of Israel. What's wrong? He's now mad. Please get him out of my sight. He's a dog. He must have understood something about their culture or tradition or something that made him behave like that. Maybe they don't kill mad people. Maybe they, but, but just check out. You're going to see how this man has been through stuff. Anyways, after a while, he escapes from Ashish, from Gath, and runs to some uh, desert area called Ziklag, where there are caves and stuff like that. And along the line, 
he goes, he picks up people who are destitute, people who are destitute, can't feed themselves. He say, come and join me, like Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves. Come and join me, let's go. This is a man who has been anointed by Samuel and say, you are king of Israel. And we are going to try and capture, picture exactly what he's going through. So the Bible lets us to know that eventually he was able to raise 400 men like that. They will go like that, then they will go and raid Amalekites. Get 10, 15 men, they will go to Amalekite territory, raid them, collect their cattle, it's all there in the scriptures. Collect their cattle, collect their goats, collect their money, they will come. That's how they were growing. They were like Ali Baba and the 40 tips. That's just what it was. That was how he was surviving at that time. Where are you now? Are you in a place where you are like an Ipa Bad of 40 Thieves? It looks as if you are just destabilized. It looks like you are disoriented. God is still with you. God is still for you. There are certain mysterious things that will happen in the pathway to destiny. And we must understand these things and understand how to navigate our way with God with these things. The mentality of a fighter. So by the time these 400 men that he was gradually beginning to know, they also went for something. Now, this time, so, so what's his name? Um, uh, King uh, Ashish of Gath wanted to go and fight Israel. And he said, David, I want you to come with your men and join me. You're a good warrior. Because he's been loyal to me all the while he's been here. Can you imagine? He's an exile in that land of Philistines. He was an exile in Philistines. Can, can you imagine? How will God take you to the enemy's territory to go and be loyal to the enemy just because it's part of your it's part of the pathway of your destiny to fulfilling of, of, of your of your of God's strategy for you to fulfill destiny? There's nowhere else for him to go. I want you who are listening to me to realize the pathway to destiny is fraught with many battles. Many of those battles you are not going to understand. You are just going to walk by faith with God. For David, we are told, I don't know if I will have so much time because I have so much inside of me to share. But if you read 2 Samuel and chapter 8 from verse 1 to about 13, 14, if you read it, one of the things you are going to come across is that you will see how that the Bible begins to Tell you, by this time in 2 Samuel, David is now king of Israel. Saul had died and he was now king. But when he became king, Israel was a defeated, was just nothing. In fact, Philistines had just defeated Samuel, uh, Saul, killed Saul, killed all his sons. Israel was in disarray. Nobody thought anything could come out of Israel. But David came and he became the most powerful king of that realm. When you read some, the, the, the David in 2 Samuel, it begins to, begins to reel out all David's victories. It tells you how David, he killed, he destroyed uh, uh, Methag and Ammon and took them away. He won the battle over the people of Moab. He made them lie down on the ground. He took all their gold. David fought King Hadidezer of the Rehob. He, he, everybody, just read the whole thing for the sake of time. One battle after the other, but he fought almost 70 different major battles to establish Israel. One after the one, other, and he didn't lose any. Some of us, we think that the pathway to destiny is just in our cry. And we have a victim mentality. You don't understand that you have one life. And this one life is not going to just, you know, be, destiny is not going to come just as a platter. I'm, I'm so underprivileged. I have no father. I have no mother. Keep quiet. That's not the word of faith. That's not the spirit of God. We know from the scripture, <coughs> excuse me, we know from the scriptures that, listen, before David could fight these external battles and lay hold of divine destiny, he had to win internal battles. Many internal battles. There are too many that I will not exhaust them, but I'm going to talk about a few because one of the battles you're going to win is the battle of your mind. I hope you know that. Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians and chapter 10 from verse 3 to verse 6. It says that we, 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 the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to go to the pulling down of strongholds. It says, for we, for we war in, the, in, in the, 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 the battles we are fighting, they are not, they are not, they are not carnal. 
but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. I want to just read it very quickly for you. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, in the physical body, we, are not, we do not war after the flesh. You must understand this, that in the pathway to destiny, you must cast down, imagine, you must win the battle in your mind. The first battleground is a battleground in your mind. I'm going to talk about three battlegrounds over the next course of the next uh, four, 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 who knows, maybe even five weeks. And, and, and let me tell you something. If you take that battle and you, you win that battle, understand that battle, there's a reason Satan's going after your mind. Because when you hear David fought King Hedediah, this way, in fact, there's one they say fought the king of Syria. If you know who Syria was, who would dare go against Syria? David's mentality was, you know, I wonder sometimes why God did not bring David in the time of Moses. But there's a reason because his mentality, it didn't come by accidents. It came by winning, first of all, the battles of the mind. Because we'll talk about the battle of the mind, battle in the spirit realm, and then this physical battle on ground here. Different battles that you're going to win. But the first one you must win, dearly beloved, is the battle of your mind. Do you know that David, one of the battles he had to win was the battle of inferiority complex? Why? Is the, that, that, that victim mentality, I'm a victim. There are many people who are going through this life, and one of the reasons why they will never fulfill destiny is I'm a victim. Why is this happening to me? Why can't listen? You can never fulfill the purposes of God in your generation if you feel like I'm a victim. I'm underprivileged, I'm unprivileged, I don't have this, I didn't have this, I have no father, I have no mother. Listen, David was overlooked. David was undervalued. He was a neglected child. Yes, he was. But he fought and he overcame inferiority complex to be the winner that he was. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, I do not, I'm not going to read everything, but from verse 1 to 11, you see the story of how Samuel, the prophet of God, whom everybody revered, the Bible said they revered God and Samuel. One of the greatest ever of Jewish prophets. The Bible says that Samuel came, God told him, go and anoint, I've rejected Saul, go and I've selected his son amongst the sons of Jesse. And of course, we all know the story. And then when Samuel went there, he says, yes, I have seven sons. I mean, why would somebody say, I have seven sons when I have eight sons? What will make somebody to say, I have seven sons, but I have eight sons? This is what Jesse said. So you have, yes, oh, they're all here. They are seven, I have seven sons. After Samuel goes one after the other, some of them are big, they are strong, a liar. He says, none of them. Samuel said, no, none of the Lord's. Don't you have another son? He said, oh, okay, there is one more. There's one more. He's intending, bring him quickly, bring him quickly. And as he saw him, he said, that's the Lord's anointed. If this man is not sensitive, this prophet Samuel, David would definitely be overlooked because he's overlooked. He's overlooked. He's the one that nobody really cares for. They just threw him in the backside of the desert somewhere. And I want to say to you, if you are going to win in this battle, if you are going to lay hold of destiny, if you are going to win and leave the will of God in your generation and fulfill the destiny that God has got for you, you must conquer by faith anything that makes you feel inferior. Anything that makes you feel like a victim, you are not a victim. You must have a mentality, I'm born again to win. I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am not disadvantaged for God is with me. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. David had to win that battle. Little wonder when they tell him, king of Syria. He says, who's king of Syria? He's bigger than us. The mentality has changed. 